greater than symbol visualizations. Good morning. Thank you, Ben, and everybody at Tavis Tree. Um, I'm very excited to be here today to talk to you about words and visuals. And I have to just start off by saying that what I'm going to talk about is essentially two key points. The first point is so obvious as to be almost a waste of your time knowing what you all do for a living, but I'm going to get past that one very quickly, I think. Uh, and then the second one is potentially very obvious to many of you, um, but I think also will have some, uh, a very sort of minor uh, insight that will hopefully help us uh, help you do your work better uh, every day. Um, so words and visuals. I'm going to start off with what's probably the most famous data visualization there is. Yeah, it's now a data viz conference. The Menard has shown up. And uh, for those of you who know what this is, I am going to spend 12 minutes on it. I apologize. For those of you who don't know what this is, if there is anybody, uh, it will be explained. So I've taken this very famous data visualization, and I have removed the graphical elements. We're just looking at the text and the data. And we can make some sense of it. It's a bit of a mess. Uh, I can't understand it completely. Visuals are a good thing. I'm a visual guy, even though I also started in radio. Um, but it really doesn't tell us as much as it could. Conversely, if I have just the graphics and, of course, no text, no data, nothing at all, it literally means nothing, right? Annotations, labeling, contextual setting text is important stuff. So that is the first premise here that I'm trying to get to is that your words are more important than your visuals. Really, without the words, your visuals mean nothing. Now, if we take a look at this thing and we start to layer in the words, or in this case, the data, we, can, we do start to be able to make sense of this. So I have these lines, and now I see numbers next to the lines, and if I have some graphical literacy, I can start to say to myself, all right, I get it. I think that the numbers correspond to the line thickness. That's cool. All right, now I've added geographic information. It's Eastern Europe. If I know geography, I know that Kovno and Vilna are in Lithuania, and Moscow is in Russia, and maybe this is a map-like thing, but I still don't know anything more than geography. Uh, I get this interesting, weird call-out text added, the Cossacks passed the frozen Neiman at a gallop, which is a weird call-out for this graphic, as you all know. Um, the word Cossacks is a sort of a time-based thing, right? We don't call Russians Cossacks today. They didn't in the 14th or 13th or maybe even the 15th century, so this is a historical thing, I now think. Now I see that there's temperature, great, it was cold, fine, I still don't know what's going on until finally I get the title of the graphic, and I can see, yes, this is about the French invasion of Russia in 1812, all right, great. A little bit of context setting text, really this is more of telling me who this thing was done by, and the legend. So all of the sense that I can make of this graphic is now here because the words were layered in, and yes, I layered them in a certain order, um, and held the best for the last when I can actually make the full sense of it. But even if I had done it in a different order, it doesn't really all come together until you have more and more of the text there. So what does this all mean? What I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell the story of the Menard graphic in the words that I use to essentially explain this graphic to my workshop students. So bear with me as I explain this for those of you who have heard this like 8,000 times. Um, so if you look at the upper left-hand corner, and I'll use my laser pointer if it can reach that far, which it can't. I'll just point. So upper left-hand corner, we have a line. The thickness of the line tells us how many people were in Napoleon's army, 400 and something thousand men. Some guys get stationed up to the north. They're the lucky ones. Spoiler alert on that one. We'll come back to that later on. Marching eastward, some other guys get posted somewhere else. Marching eastward, marching eastward, the line gets smaller and smaller and smaller because the army's getting smaller. People are dying, etc. Because the Russians were strategically fighting and retreating, scorched earth campaign, burning the fields, right? Napoleon couldn't feed his army, supply his army, it's a big problem. Marching Easter, marching Easter, they get almost all the way to Moscow. There's a huge battle, and Napoleon loses a third of his army, 72,000 men. Disaster. Okay, finally gets to Moscow. He's down to 100,000. He started out with over 400,000 men. Not going so well. Napoleon's there for a little while, I think only about a month. He says, you know what, this is not working out. Time to turn around and go home. That's the black line going back. Retreating, people are still dying in droves or abandoning ship, whatever it is. We can see the line getting thinner and thinner. We also now see the connection between the temperature. It was a brutally cold Eastern European winter. Okay, I see what's going on here. Finally get back. These guys who are stationed in Polotsk rejoin. They were not quite as lucky as the other guys I mentioned earlier because as you can see right after that they crossed the Berezina River. Half the army yet again, 25,000 men lost. And yes, the line eventually gets down to 4,000 men. Those 6,000 lucky ones rejoin, it ends up at 10,000. So 
that's the story that I tell. That's a story I reconstructed from the graphic and the data and from Tufty and whoever else. And that's a good story to tell. That's a story I like to tell about this data. So those words essentially bring me to my second point. Because the way that I tell that story, yes, to my workshop audience, in this case, it's for an audience, but this is how I tell the story to myself or how I would have told the story to myself were I creating a graphic to depict that data. Okay? And those words will essentially do a lot of heavy lifting for me when it comes to creating visuals. Because words can plant visuals in your brain and in your audience's brain. For instance, if I was to ask you to go on a journey with me for a second and say, uh, you know, imagine the 12 month moving average of the unemployment rate over the past 10 years. It's done nothing but decline. I bet that I have planted a line chart in 99% of your brains using just words. And I didn't even say go down. You know, I tried to avoid words that would make you think up and down, et cetera. You can do this with your words. Your words will, will drive you to a visual. So the question becomes, what if I chose different words for the Menard story, for the Menard data, all right? So here's an example. What if my words, the story that I wanted to tell about the data, was the invasion was a, was a disaster. There was a crap ton of starvation, battle wounds, desertions, etc. But the vast majority were whatever it is. So it's a proportional diagram. I just want to talk about the reasons for the death, and I'm not talking about all the other data. Of course, proportional diagram, you're going to go with a 3D pie chart, <laughs> right? Is that like skepticism? Okay, yeah, maybe not a 3D pie chart. Maybe we'll go with a historical example. Maybe we can do a stacked bar chart or a Du Bois uh, spiral. Is that what we said it should be called, Jason? Yeah. Du Bois spiral. You know, this is a stacked bar chart. And because the proportions are so out of whack, you could never see that little diagonal blue segment unless you had that spiral to think. This, your brain wouldn't do this automatically, but it's an amazingly interesting example of a proportional diagram. Sure, why not? What if my story was, it was a disaster, what went wrong? Yes, all those things I mentioned before. But surprisingly, the reasons varied during different periods. If that's the point that I really want to communicate, what am I going to do in that case? Right? What diagram, what visual might work? An area chart? Sure. How they changed over time. Or stealing another historical example. Of course, Florence Nightingale did exactly this. Right? Why people were dying during the Crimean War over time. A certainly a viable option there. What if this was my story? It was a disaster. 422,000 men to start, 10,000 men at the end, and because it was freaking freezing out. I'm not talking about when the temperature changed. I'm not talking about you know, the Battle of Beres uh, Borodino or crossing the Berezina River. I'm just saying it was freaking cold out. That's all I want you to get out of it, okay? I could do a waffle plot to show the data and an infographic -y description or depiction of it was cold, right? Just a picture and temperature, maybe a number, that's it. That tells that story that I used in the words when I was talking to myself about it. What if I said it was a disaster? Each month, staggering losses, 10% every month at least, with two months that were particularly bad, a third of the army during the Battle of Ordino and half the army. You know, it's a percentage display. I'm talking about time, snapshots in time, percentage, of course, we're all gonna go with 100% stack bar chart. It's just obvious, because those are the words that I used. Each month, this percentage of losses, et cetera, et cetera. Those words drove me to the visual. And finally, I'm gonna to try to implant an image in Alberto's brain, at least, and maybe not just Alberto. It was a disaster, 422,000 men to start, 10,000 men at the end, a 98% loss. What image are you seeing? What image are you seeing based on this data? I had 422,000 men to start, ended up with 10,000 men. Or a slope graph, you said. He said a slope graph. Didn't he? Yeah. That's an option. It's not the only option, right? There are plenty of options here. I'm not saying it's going to be obvious every time. But yeah, a slope diagram in this case is a, an approach that could work with a big giant label with a 98% loss. Um, your words can drive you to visuals, right? Multiple visuals, yes. The words could stand alone, right? I could use designy type things to make the words work in a visual way. But this would work if it was 12-point type, which brings me back to my first point. Your words are more important than your visuals because they can stand alone. But the second point is, yes, your words will lead you to your visuals, okay? 
So what I'm talking about here, though, is it's all about how you talk to yourself. Okay, this isn't about how you speak to an audience, because the words you use when you tell your story to your audience may be much tighter, much more concise. They should be, and much more edited. But the words you talk to yourself when you're doing your work will lead you to the visuals, and it's all about using an insane amount of detail. It's about not being afraid to edit out the noise you will edit out for the audience version of it. Um, vomit all the details on the page, right? Um, this is a 100% guaranteed way to solve problems on projects. And that's actually how I came up with it as a technique. Because when I work with clients, I try to get them to tell me the stuff at the beginning. Hey, what does the data say? What's interesting? What are you trying to communicate about it? And 98% of the time, they're like, oh yeah, we don't know. Let's figure that out later. I'm like, okay, fine. We'll work on it without knowing. And then we get somewhere down the road and they're not happy. Something's not working quite right. And I say, okay, how about you write down a paragraph or three that says what you want this thing to say? And don't edit, just tell me what you think it should be. When they write that down, every single time, the next iteration is perfect or pretty darn close to perfect. Okay, this technique works to solve blocks in data storytelling projects every time. And the way I work usually when I do it is first it's an outline. My buckets of content for the Menard story are 400,000 guys started, but there were a few lucky ones who went over here, Scorched Earth Campaign, Battle of Borodino, Winter came, crossing the river, and it was still freaking cold out, and finally it was a disaster, right? We ended up with 10,000 men. That outline then leads me to start talking to myself. Start using the sentences that will actually flow that outline together. I don't always write it down, sometimes it's in the back of my mind, but I literally think in those words, and I, is it flowing? Is there continuity? Is there logic to what I'm talking about? Is this a good story, is really what it comes down to. And I'm constantly gut checking between the 30,000 foot outline view. Did I cover all the six things? Are they in the right order? Does this flow to this, to this? All the way down into the, the details and the weeds of those detailed words. And so if I look back at the original Menard, okay, and I think about my story, the words that I used to tell that story, and the very specific words that I know I really want to emphasize, the 400,000 men, the Battle of Bordino, et cetera, and I think about the visual that tells my story, and I look at this thing and I ask, is this the best representation of my story? And I have to say no. And it's not because Menard isn't awesome, it's because this doesn't tell my story perfectly. So my take on the Menard for my story because of the words I used, without redoing what he did, it's still a flow map, it's still almost the exact same thing, just some slight tweaks, right? It's literally, okay, I have some text, I have some numbers here and there, but not all of them. I took out a lot of them. I, don't, I didn't talk about the step-by-step the -step, you know, redu reduction in numbers during those you know, uh, scorched earth campaigns. It's a little hard to see up there, sorry about that. Um, I did call attention to the Battle of Borodino and the, and the, the crossing the Berezina River. I did talk about the 100,000 number, et cetera. So little contextual labeling to tell my story, a little context setting text at the beginning, which is not just a legend and who, who made this thing, which is what Menard's uh, standard was, which is fine, it was 1869, very different time from now. And you'll notice that my context setting text is actually that really tight, short version of the story that I turned into a slope graph. Because the context setting text, again, the text for my audience is not what I'm talking about. That text can be a very edited, and should be a very edited, tight uh, context setting text. <laughs> um, so in the end, all I'm trying to say with you uh, to you today is that your words are more important than your visuals. Your words will lead you to your visuals. So talk to yourself, use words, but choose your words carefully because your words will essentially help you make your data story sane. Thank you very much.